morning. Good morning. Uh, as um, you were told just a moment ago, my name is Matthew McCoat, and I am with Asheville Community Enterprises. Uh, the gentleman to my right is Robert King. He's um, my partner in crime, and I um, we, we're introducing to you today a product that we developed at Asheville Community Enterprises uh, named Safe Plus More. Please remember that because you hopefully will hear a lot about it more in the future. But I am a, a native of Asheville. Uh, I began uh, working with people with substance abuse problems, mental health issues back in 1991. So I worked in that field for about 25 years. Um, my partner that's with me, he's a retired uh, battalion chief with the Asheville Fire Department. Was there for 28 years, first responder. So we collaborated together with the, this project, and what we intended to do was to bring a different culture to treatment and recovery of people that have substance abuse problems and mental health issues. Uh, through my time in working with people, uh, I ran into a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different circumstances that people went through. And it reminds me of one particular case that I um, received a phone call one morning of a family that was having some problems. And when I got to the house, the problem that they had was their 15-year-old kid had gone to his father's bedroom, found his gun, and shot himself in the head. And the family, of course, uh, ran to see what the noise was. His younger brothers and sisters went up, and they all had to witness him on the floor in that condition. The parents, of course, were completely distraught. So by the time I got to them to kind of talk to them a little bit to see what had gone on, they found out that he had been suffering from um, being bullied in school and he couldn't deal with it anymore. But he had been suffering in silence. And most things that I have witnessed throughout my years is witnessing people suffering in silence. And there's reasons behind that. But along with that, there's been a lot of occasions that um, I've been in touch with people and they're crying out for help but don't know how to access help. So what we wanted to do in this platform was develop something that made uh, working with people more comfortable for them, uh, easily accessible, and also that it enhanced the services that were around. And one of the things that I, I'm bearing witness to, and I'm sure you all can also bear witness to, in the last couple of weeks, every night on the news, there's a new story about something in the opiate uh, with the opioid problem, the opioid crisis, also the mental health issues that are going on post-pandemic. But the thing that I, you know, have to, to make note of is that even though those numbers are continuing to escalate, it, it has never been that we haven't had that problem. It's just more prevalent now because after, in the past two years, we put more focus on it. Between that, the gun violence and the different things, all of those things are associated with some degree of mental illness. But one of the reports said that in with the mental illness and the, the numbers that are needing to be treated right now, there's not enough counseling to go around. They're already inundated with the, the numbers that they are dealing with. And as they also report, even in North Carolina, there's about 50% of the people that have mental illness that are totally untreated. So if they're already inundated with the numbers that they're dealing with, the 50% that are untreated are really in a bad position. So what, again, what we did in this app was we tried to, to put a, a panel together um, that would give people more of what they need so that they could support people more longer and even better in some circumstances. And the thing about it is, and I'll say this before I get to the slide, in most cases, people are that have access to treatment 
even if you're undergoing some type of therapy, you're only there for a short period of time, but you're away from whatever that care is for a lot longer. And what happens with that is that treatment stops when you leave, and then you have to kind of pick it up on your own. Well, through the app, you're able to continue to support people even after they leave your treatment facility, even after they leave your uh, inpatient or whatever the services are that you render, you'll be able to support them even when they're at home. So if they're at 3 o'clock in the morning and have a crisis, they'll have some way to reach out that's comfortable to them. The national statistics that I've put up on the screen here tells us that in, in, um, in the world, there's in the nation, there's 60 million people suffering from some sort of substance use disorder. That's 60 million people, 25% of all Americans suffer from some form of anxiety. The thing about it is it makes it so, so comfortable for me is I know everyone can attest to knowing someone that has some level of need. Uh, in North Carolina, there in North Carolina, this so far in 2022, there's been 2,493 overdoses. That's about nine a day that overdose. And I don't have it with me today, but I keep a few pictures of some very young people that have gone through um, overdose and that actually died. And it really motivates me to continue to push to get more care out there. The problems that, I, that this app tries to address is the lack of accessibility to care when needed and the affordability associated with the service. Also reducing the stigma of receiving treatment and services and the need for a space that is comfortable for its users to engage with the supportive care services. <clears throat> to get into the app just a little bit, the app is a, a, a platform that enables agencies, organizations, and institutions to communicate with and coordinate support services to their staff, clients, members, in relation to issues that affect their lives, work and relationships in the community and with each other. The app is individually tailored to the specific needs of each user group. What we try to address at this point is treatment centers, counseling agencies, churches, school systems, social services, law enforcement, first responders, and healthcare systems. We try to get um, each of them to use a service like this to enhance what they're already doing. So we're not trying to reinvent anything, we're just trying to add more services to it. Thanks. Uh, some of the content that we've been able to use so far that has been helpful with the agencies that we're working with is in substance abuse, of course, mental health, LGBTQ, uh, racism, trauma, sexual assault, physical abuse, and bullying. There's a special part of the app that is unique to the offering, and that is the multi-tier alert system. I developed that because um, in most of the beacon systems or the alert systems that are available now, they're one-on-one -on -one GPS locators, and I wanted something because I believe that gave people that were going through trauma a false sense of security in case they reached out to someone and they were busy or the phone was off or not getting a good signal. I wanted them to be able to preset groups of people that anytime they needed someone, they, they could notify a group. And with this particular uh, beacon system, it's um, user-driven, so you can't track people with it, but when they need someone, they can reach out, and within seconds, the, the um, recipient group will receive a GPS coordinate map to show exactly where they are so that they can get there and come to their rescue. The magic. Safe Plus More strives to empower agencies, organizations, and individuals with the creation of safe and supportive, a, a safe and supportive digital environment. Um, agencies uh, give the agencies the ability to correspond and support their clients and members, uh, membership base with pertinent information resources from a central source. That way, they can extend their services if you only have a short uh, a number of staff you can treat and service more people because you can do it from your office instead of having to have physical contact all the time. 
Uh, also, you have the ability to send push notifications, which I think is, is really helpful because it gives them an opportunity to continue giving affirmations throughout the day. So if people are away and they're going through, they may still be in silence, but they can continue to get text messages from their, their provider source that gives them some kind of motivation. Uh, the privacy alert, which I just explained to you, that is something that is really key to this because people, again, need more control over their care and how they are supported. The traction, and uh, this, this endeavor started in 2017. We formally launched in, in 2020, right in the midst of the pandemic. Um, we've uh, onboarded 40 uh, agencies. We're working, and they're working with about 2,000 users right now. Um, the revenue model that we have is a uh, multi-tier system because it's important how large, how the size of the organization as to the pricing structure. Uh, right now, we have a multi-year contract with the city of Asheville and also Buncombe County, and we are working on a grant through the Dartmouthwood Health Trust Foundation. So. I know that's a lot of information, but there's a lot of need out there. And what we're trying to do is we're not trying to reinvent the system, as I said. We're trying to enhance what's available now because the outcry that we're hearing, not only in the community, but even through the media, is that there's not enough. We need more. And we can't continue to, to do the same things that we've always done because we'll continue to get the same results that we've always gotten. Now we need to go to an innovative process, and that is a digital environment. So with that, my friends, is safe plus one.
as a result of that, he is still with us. So that is one of the success launches. Yeah, so uh, very interesting. This sounds really valuable and like can help a lot of people. Um, what are you finding are the biggest challenges in getting uh, agencies to adopt it? Just that um, people are used to doing things one way, and no one wants to feel that the way they've been doing things is inadequate. So when you start to try to introduce a new way or a new system of doing things, it's kind of a lot of pushback just in that mere fact. And it's not that the, the app itself is conflicting with anything, it's just that they're not used to using it. So it's much more the change of behavior than the cost. Exactly. Well, um, yes, and hopefully we 
we'll get there. But right now, um, it's been adopted by the actual um, internal needs of the fire department and the police department ser uh, servicing the actual first responders. Um, so they need as much, they, they need care just as much as the general public does. So we've kind of focused in on that at this point. But to answer, to further answer that question, yes, it will be something that we can scale up to show how it can make a difference. Because the one thing that is synonymous with all of those scenarios is that there's a mental health element to all of it. And more than likely they're being untreated or underserved. And so by adding more continuity to that, I believe that we will be in that space. So. Yeah, uh, I, have a, I have a comment and a question. A comment, thank you for doing this. Uh, it's great, you all have some great passion here, and, and it's, a, it's a really cool need that you're serving. Uh, the support people that support kind of the folks in society, you know, the police, the fire, and, and other folks. So that's a really cool group. Um, so I appreciate your passion for doing that. The question I have is, um, what I like about it is it, it seems like it's an in-community helping their own community. It's, yes. the, it's the firehouse helping the firehouse. It's the, it's the police station helping, helping the police station. Um, I imagine that helps people reach out because it's not reaching out to a stranger. I'm reaching out to Joe or Sarah that I know on the forest or whatever. Um, do you do any work on moving stigma for reaching out? Or how, how do you approach that when you, when you join a new community? sign them up to the app, how do you kind of convince the folks that it's worthwhile to reach out for help? You know, how, how do you get to make the first action? Yeah. So, so with that, the, the, it's all about the messaging. Um, the platform is set and it's individually tailored to the, to the organization. So if it's a first responder, for example, the culture of the first responder is you know, just what they know and, it, and, and that's what they subscribe to. So it's up to the messaging with the first responders as to how they convey that to the other staff and the other administration that the need, you know, the need is there and can be addressed and that kind of thing. And again, it's about change of the way people do things. Right now, we've always we've, um, had, had access to uh, making uh, Appointments and things like that, conventionally through phone calls and that kind of thing. But to be able to sit in your living room when the need actually arises and actually connect right there, and the, the, the anonymity of it is, is that if you're in the living room and you're connecting with it, no one in the family or no one around you has to know. Because the biggest part of the stigma is you don't want anyone to know that you're suffering. So you just suffer in silence until the rise, and then we all get that. Statistics wind up in the paper. So it's all about the messaging. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question for you. Right. Yes. My name is Nick Ray. Um, uh, just elaborating a little bit on what um, you said about the inmates. Have you, this is two question thing. Have you considered um, partnering up or reaching out to bail and bonds and agency because they would have full access to the inmates and even people are reoccurring inmates as well? Um, you can also mention. Yes, we have uh, uh, talked to people, uh, people in the bond industry because it is, like I said, a captive audience uh, for sure. Um, they are, again, it's a change of the way they do things. And right now, they're used to making phone calls and emails and chasing people down. So once we get that messaging changed, hopefully they'll, they'll enter the space as well. And the, the, oh, the overdoses, that is, again, through treatment. I don't want to even give the indication that treatment does not work. I just believe that with being able to support people longer and support people more in the spaces away from treatment, I believe we began to, to diminish that. Yes. Hi. Sorry. Hi there. I'm Amy Marie from I was um, kind of curious 
from a marketing standpoint, how you guys are reaching out to individuals who may already have an interest in your services, like direct marketing through Facebook ads, per se, where you're targeting either college communities where you can get into colleges and be able to be a resource, because I feel like a lot of college students would really benefit from the security that would come from it being anonymous, like how you have it structured. So I think that would be a really great value for a lot of different colleges in North Carolina, but then also being able to target different counseling agencies and get in touch with somebody who already has an active interest in your app. Cool. We have, um, for the past three years, we've talked to several colleges, local colleges, and they have an interest in it, but most of them have some sort of app that they deploy and the, the uh, colleges, and of course, no one wants to say that theirs is not working. So, of course, it's a little, little heavy lift for them. But the thing is, is that it is one of the areas that we want to go to in terms of how are we getting the word out there and how we're marketing this. Right now, it's just through word of mouth because we just launched in 2020, uh, in 2020, and here in 2022, now the post pandemic, we're able to get out and actually do some in person meetings. We are doing some social media blitzes as well, so you'll probably see some more of that in the future, but that's kind of in the scaling up process. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great presentation. Thanks for coming. I love the purpose. You're a for profit enterprise, correct? Yes. Can you talk a little bit, explore a non profit designation and tell us a little bit about why you chose to go the profit route and um, how that is helping or hurting your? Well, I, for, for one, just personally, I was a uh, nonprofit executive for 20, 28 years. And uh, that world is, uh, you know, it, it goes with the politics, it moves, it changes. And so it's not any way to really get the, the foundation that I was looking for with the app. So I chose to go the for profit route. It is a little, little harder, but in, in a sense, it's not because the best part about being the for profit is that you can always partner with the fiscal agent that is a nonprofit and do the same thing. So that's kind of the direction that I've chosen to go. Hi, hi, I'm Aaron. Uh, great presentation. I just wanted to uh, follow up and ask the question. You were talking about some universities, especially, they already have their own app and they're not necessarily willing to adopt a new one. Have you looked into any white labeling or being able to sort of reskin your app for to better fit their needs and uses? I, I have and I've considered it, but just in the scaling up process, that's not a market that is you know priority right now because they do have something available. I'm looking more to the general public because they're the ones that are lacking the most right now. So just in, again, the, the initial scaling up right now, we're just kind of focused in on the general public. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Colin. Uh, I have a question about capacity. Yes. So if you, you're, you said you're sitting at right around 2,000 users right now. So if you were to expect them to say 50,000 users or the city of Asheville, do you have capacity to support some of them? Yes. Like yes, definitely. Website, but again, that, that's not something that I push to the forefront. 
Will that be accessible on the app for someone that doesn't go to the website? Uh, not at this point, no. And, and again, it's only because the first person, and I got this directly from um, one of the first agencies that we were working with. The first question that we got when we entered the room, is this a way that you're going to track me? And so that was the first question that we got before we got to pre present the app to someone, to, to this agency. So I really wanted to pull back away from anything that even has the, the image that they may have their information out there anyway. So. Yeah, I'm sure I've got a question to you, Zon. Curious about just the, the, the tech aspects. Did you have tech expertise in house? Did you work with like an agency to develop the app? And were there any challenges, or were there like things you could build on existing technologies? Well, yeah, I, I had the best um, tech developer in the world in Anthroware. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I tell you what, I wouldn't be here today if it was not for Anthroware because I came to the table with a passion, and I came to the table with energy. And I had to put that somewhere and get it put into some kind of uh, mechanism. And that's what Anthroware was able to do. So there has been challenges, and one of the challenges has been taking my vision and putting it into a technical device. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for coming. So the question you had mentioned about going out to the general public. Yes, sir. So do you have thoughts in mind down the road of opening this up to the general public to make it so that just an average individual can say put their therapist in there or a therapist can do the same with their customers? Yes. Um, we actually, as a, as a part of the additional panel that I've added in recently, um, is the, has the ability for uh, practitioners to put their information in and actually um, offer their services through the app. So the general public, is, as you ask about, they can actually go on the app and look up and find clinicians that, that suit them. And by being able to look at their profile, they can find someone that fits their needs and they can schedule and get support services directly through the app. That's great. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Who has the best question? <laughs> They're all good. Here we go, John. Yes, my, my name is Mark. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I have volunteered for the Western Carolina largest homeless shelter front desk and been too frequently the number of 911 calls I've made. If you were in my shoes sitting at that front desk, you say a qualified individual, what will be your pitch on how to, to apply the app? <clears throat> what do you think is a qualified individual, or how do you qualify? Uh, the, the, I would not qualify an individual. Uh, this, I want to make this available to everyone through in need that they may have. And in, in, in an instance where you have a captive audience, like in a homeless shelter, of course, some of these will be addressed directly through the shelter administration. But uh, this is more for once they're beyond your borders or beyond the operation, that they have support that can connect them back to the operation and to outside services in case they need it. Because a lot of times, even in your instance sitting at the front desk, you can't feel all the calls for the numbers of people that come through your doors. But if you make one connection with them, and if nothing else, they can leave with this resource, then whether they return or stay, they can always connect with you and always connect with outside services so that they can get the care that they need. All right. Can we all put our hands together?
So where it may be just for, let's say, the police department, well, the police department, their entire family, the members of their family, to create a group because they're under that, that police group. So that allows them to be able to use the app as well. So it expands to beyond the agency in that sense. Okay? So that's how it expands.